So here's the thing. For the last 40 minutes, I've been trying to work out what exercise I'm going to get you to stand up and do. <laughs> so I haven't really been focusing on what I'm supposed to say, um, but that's good. Um, okay, so I am excited to be here. We've kind of been itching to get these results out. We've been working on this now. Well, the collection's been in field for about eight months, sort of in planning for about 12. Um, and we're here to talk to you about the media attributes that really matter. I'm kind of lucky that Rachel Kennedy, who I did work with for 10 years, um, spoke before me. Um, because my PhD was with Ehrenberg Bass and my training is also in the areas that she spoke of. So the fact that she's just given an amazing lecture on the foundations of how advertising works and how good media works kind of helps me morph into what, how we've applied that and what we've done. Um, so yeah, I, I've been a media researcher now um, probably for about 14 years. I just want to change this, excuse me. Um, doesn't matter, I'll wing it like any good woman would. <laughs> um, I've been a media researcher now for about 14 to 15 years. And, um, you know, the, my, my entire, in fact, my PhD was in media and originally in TV, radio, press, um, and magazines from memory. And then I did a lot of work also in the digital space. Um, for me, my entire work has been around what attributes and, and to Rachel's point, she, she's done advertising how that works. For me, it's, well, once you've got an amazing campaign or an idea works, what media attributes uh, should you look for in terms of good planning? So the reality is if you spend a huge amount of time building the most amazing campaign on the planet but poorly plan on media, then your idea dies and no one will see it. So for me, again, having trained so well at Ehrenberg Bass, um, when Kim approached me a year ago and said, okay, well, can you please, you know, the, the, unfortunately the sands are shifting. Um, people seem to lose the impact. There's a lot of publicity out there with social and with digital. Um, maintaining your integrity and being platform agnostic, can you try and help us work out or unpack why TV works? And so for me, the best place to start was my baseline knowledge. And so what we did is we said, okay, well, let's, let's look at what we know, let's look at what's been tested over time, and then see how TV performs in amongst those, oh, under those conditions, but using technology that has kind of transcended some of the measurement. I mean, Rachel talked about measurement and being very inertia-based. Um, I'm all about um, taking measurement that's in um, systems now and actually applying technology to minimise human bias. So we thought we could stretch it a little bit further to improve and scale the, the um, study. So again, Rachel's kind of done this for me, um, but in a very simplistic way, um, the, the media attributes that matter are um, getting your brand remembered. So, so um, attributes or media that helps your brand get remembered and cut through um, are absolutely by far those that will help your brand grow. So you have to be seen and you have to be remembered. And I know that sounds quite simplistic, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we applied those and how we operationalised those in a minute. Um, bear in mind plus reach, absolutely. Being seen, being remembered by lots of people in the category is important, but the first 12 months has been on platform modality, so we'll be doing reach next. Now, interestingly, normally Kim sort of introduces me, and I'm about to play a video. So I have a tech team. Some of them are computer scientists. Some of them are um, software engineers. And it's pretty difficult for us to kind of talk through the depth of the code that we built to, to build the applications that sit behind it. So Kim has, fortunately for me, put a bit of a one-minute sn snippet together on how we actually collected the data. I've been given 30 minutes, and I think it's really hard to understand the scale of what we've done um, if I just stand up here and say, yeah, yeah, we did attention and we did this, this, and this. So I'm going to just play this for quickly. Hopefully you can hear it. In the advertising industry, there's a view that online, because it's trackable and measurable, is the future. But no one has really ever properly tested the merits of this belief. Until now, someone agnostic, someone academic, has come along to question the status quo, someone curious about the actual facts rather than the perceptions. Karen Nelson-Field, 
holds a PhD in media science and is a globally renowned professor of media innovation. Aided by a team of computer vision engineers and technology wizards, she has developed a unique form of artificial intelligence and machine learning to pioneer the delivery of non-biased research into the real impact of modern advertising. Commissioned by Think TV to undertake the benchmark series, the good professor and her team of boffins questioned the commonly held assumption that hyper-targeted online advertising delivers the most impact. Under natural viewing conditions, she exposed more than 2,500 everyday Aussies to some 20,000 advertisements across different platforms and devices. And then she compared how people viewed ads with what they ultimately decided to buy in a virtual store. Eye tracking software recorded people's attention across a 30 minute period for nearly 2,000 viewing sessions on mobile devices, laptops, and big screen TVs. An inbuilt app scanned screens and recorded any advertising that appeared, then used eye tracking to see whether respondents paused for how long and how much of the ad, in terms of pixels, was in view on screen. And the final stage of the research involved people shopping in a virtual supermarket. Known as discrete choice modelling, it is recognised as the most realistic way to measure consumers' actual choice of brand. The results are seismic, likely to shake up many widely held misconceptions around today's advertising platforms and ultimately show where advertisers get the most bang for their buck. So stay tuned. So that probably helps you understand scale. I mean, typically when you are measuring attention and things like that, you think of people sitting in a lab with a set of goggles on. Um, we designed um, some code that actually measures eyes on screen, eyes on ad eyes on screen and eyes off ad. And so the team, we didn't use Affectiva or any kind of, co you know, sort of off the shelf um, code. We actually built our own specifically related to the literature and related to this particular study. And it was on every device. So the app could then be downloaded on anyone's device on any TV, we also supplied cameras to about a thousand homes and it could play through their system. So it was pretty amazing. Um, so we're talking about cut through and we're also talking about brand quality today. Um, so for us, the absolute, um, I guess, benchmark of cut through is did they pay attention? And I guess, in fact, I think you even mentioned something, Rachel, from Thales today. Um, he's very much into, a professor out of Harvard, he's very much into the attention economy. And he talks about um, attention becoming so scarce that it's actually becoming a commodity. And we actually agree with that. And what we love about attention is it's a universal measure. So, um, you know, you can see how much attention someone's paying to this particular platform in this particular environment in this particular time of the day, depending on obviously technology that you have access to. So, um, Professor Teixeira says, attention is the allocation of mental resources. And, you know, this again is not rocket science. Before consumers can be affected by advertising messages, they need to be first paying attention. So, we use that as the baseline to kind of see, okay, given attention is cut through, what, how much attention is someone paying to different platforms? And we did a number of other things. We also looked at attention within different programming nuances within the television. But for the purpose of today, it's a snippet and we're talking about cross-platform. So again, we used gaze software and machine learning techniques. So we actually mathematically, um, we actually trained the data to understand uh, trajectory and gaze across, and it, because it's multiple platforms, we, we believe we're the first that has ever actually done it um, across this many platforms. And we also had it on mobile. Uh, so it was pretty crazy. Um, what we did, and um, hard to kind of explain because of the depth of the files that sit behind it, but we rated attention on a continuum from zero to 100, where um, in essence zero was they weren't even looking, uh, to 100 where they were actively viewing the ad. Now bear in mind, actively viewing the ad could be that they it was on a small screen or a big screen or just looking at it amongst other clutter. So, and on top of that, the, the technology uh, tracked five frames per second. Um, so there's a lot of data that sits behind it. So our, um, I guess our um, measure in essence is on an, in an average ad second out of a score of 100, 
bearing in mind it's a continuum, so sometimes it's passive and sometimes it's active, where do the different platforms sit? And what's important about this is that it's consistent for each platform. So again, it was really important for me to maintain, I'm still an academic as well, to maintain my independence and not be looking for patterns that TV, you know, favour or not favour. Um, but, you know, with my history, with what I know about TV, I knew that it would, you know, do well. Um, but, again, this was consistent across device and across, consistent across platforms. So we didn't, we didn't favour one or the other. Um, again, that's what I wanted to say. It's a leving, level playing field for all platforms. So what we found, which is probably, again, not surprising to you both or to everyone, is that in an average ad second, TV scores more objective attention. Now, again, I wanted to talk about objective attention because... We didn't ask them how much attention they paid. It's not a self-proclaimed measure. They didn't, I mean, they knew because they had to opt in, but they didn't actually understand what we were doing in the background other than they had to activate their camera and the app did that for them. Um, so absolutely TV scores much, much higher attention per ad second on average. And, you know, to me, this doesn't really surprise me. What the next few slides are about is what unpacks it. So just unpacking that aggregate score, this is how the non-viewing, passive viewing and active viewing looks to be open and fair to everyone in case they feel that we're being too black box within the aggregated score. So we can see that TV commands twice as much active viewing as YouTube. I also circled the 94% because Facebook's attention, and one journalist has actually asked me this in the last few days, Facebook attention is perhaps a little bit higher than people would think. Um, we rate passive attention, in fairness. So we think that, I mean, active attention without a doubt is gold standard. I mean, if you're looking at the ad, you are making a cognitive decision to view something, usually. Um, but passive attention does have a role to play. And as you can see, that's where Facebook make up a lot of their ground. So the reality is that, you know, um, as there's some sort of com um, subconscious process happening if you are kind of sort of looking to the side but not really paying attention. And this is good then for TV as well because then it's sort of, you know, you might be in the room and not looking at it, but you can see it in the peripheral vision or hear it, etc. So, so passive and active are the two that we, we rate quite highly. Um, okay, so I wanted to kind of move in. We had two measures of impact. So we started with attention because, you know, we're technically, I guess, a research meets tech company. Um, but we also wanted to have a look at sales. I mean, at the end of the day, sales are the gold standard. And I've got some... In the future, attention will actually be a predictive measure. That's my prediction. Kind of weird to say it in the same sentence. But I believe that attention will be a predictive measure of sales. We can already see, and I think it's eight sets of data and counting, that attention is... <laughs> I won't say correlated because we did regression, but um, it is very related and has a very strong relationship with sales. And it's so consistent across all sets of data. So we're really excited for that because, to be honest, collecting sales in the way that we did, bear in mind we had about eight or ten groups, test and control groups across Australia. Sales is hard to collect. We had to control for so much. So we chose discrete choice modelling which is what the video described, which is essentially once they'd actually looked at the content or viewed the content, and I'll explain a little bit about how we did that in a minute, then they were directed to an online virtual shopping experience where they had choice of, and it was, it was lots of categories, lots of choices. I think in the end there were about 38,000 brand choices that over the entire survey people had expo exposure to. So it was massive. Um, but it was hard to collect because, as anyone knows, um, often people get bored with doing something for 30 minutes and so we'd, ha we'd have to keep pumping up our sample because we needed to get our true single source which was actual viewing and actual sales data which we ended up getting. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is the measure that we use now. I know that the geniuses of long-term brand building are here. 
Um, but we, we did a massive experiment, okay? So we needed to take a snapshot in time and we used short-term advertising strength. And I just wanted to explain that I, I don't need to overly complicate how we measured it, etc. but it's a gold standard measure of short-term sales impact. And the reason why I'm making a point of that is that there is a caveat here. This is an experiment, so it's a short-term effect, which is basically, were you exposed, did you buy? Or were you not exposed, did you buy? And look at the differences between them. And that's how we modelled it out. So we had our discrete choice data, and then we analysed it using quite simple short-term advertising strength, which is gold standard for that. Back to the creative, I wanted to explain how we got that because I'm not sure the video really, and I had a question this morning from a journo asking me this question. To make this as natural as possible, what we did is this. We started with YouTube natural exposure and we built some technology to sit behind the platform. Okay, And basically it's an intercept, like an ad intercept technology. It does a couple of other things which I'll tell you about in a minute as well. But what it did was it said, go for it, just go on to YouTube, don't do anything other than say yes to the camera um, and just use it naturally. Okay, so what our technology did was, and this was our largest sample in the, in the group, um, it basically um, tagged advertising and pulled the data or pulled the video off of YouTube and put it into a, um, a bucket in essence. And then what we could do is we then could populate the television content with that exact same creative. So that group A, which there were multiple groups in the YouTube group, but group A saw the exact same creative as group B and group C. So what we then did with Facebook to make sure it was completely natural was we intercepted their ad load. Okay, so it's a bit like an ad blocker kind of piece of technology. So it's not just ad tagging, but we add we use the code behind ad blocking and we then dropped this content or these these um, ads into the natural Facebook experience. So the customer would not have, or well, the viewer had no idea that the ads they saw were not specifically purpose for them. Someone asked me this morning, well, you know, does that mean, you know, how does that work? Because half of the time, which I don't believe is half the time, there's relevancy around the ad load. And I said, yes, but it was consistent across all platforms. So that's the important part here. So everything we're doing is like for like for like. There's no apples, oranges, and pears. Um, so given attention is so highly correlated to sales, this is not unexpected um, and the patent didn't surprise us. So um, in terms of product choice, and if you think of it a bit like an index where 100 is our baseline, um, YouTube, Facebook, TV, and obviously TV gains more attention and then sales in that order, obviously you can't, it's not the other way around, um, the patterns are striking. So that's where the press has come from in the last couple of days, that TV drives more sales, but it is directly related to attention, to be honest. And I'll explain and unpack that in a second. So I think the key takeout for this section is the platform that commands the greatest attention gets the sale, without a doubt. And look out for some stuff we're doing with predictive attention. I think that that will be quite interesting next. So we wanted to also have a look at clutter um, as an artifact, I guess, of cut through. Um, and reconsider, I wrote, because to be honest, some of the earlier work I did with probably Rachel and Byron at Ehrenberg Bass Institute. So a lot of the time, clutter, and, and it's got a long history. It's got a long history of having a negative impact on brand favorability, um, memory impairment, uh, lots and lots of things, sales, and even some of my own work, which was published around 2012, 13, um, shows the obvious patterns. And you often, often clutter is um, looked at in one way, and I'll show you what we've done. Clutter is typically looked at how many ads in an ad pod were there, and if you reduce the amount of ads in an ad pod, does that help? or hinder recall, and it's typically recall, which is very outdated now. Um, but 
the patterns even then were striking, and that's the truth. The reality is that clutter does impair ability to be remembered and recalled, and my own personal work, so the TV and radio work was done prior to my, um, it was from literature, and I actually did some work in the Facebook space, knowing that the clutter on Facebook, in terms of the amount of ads you're exposed to, is so much, I would expect it to be so much higher. So we did that, we, we actually looked at, we, we, we had 200 students actually come through use, and we, we <laughs> I remember that was my early coding days, we, we noted, I think we screen recorded what they did on Facebook and then I had all these poor students like noting down how many ads did they see and how, at what point. So I think it was a six month coding effort. It's actually quite funny now when I think about it. Um, so yeah, obviously recall drops considerably when clutter goes higher. But there's more to clutter. Clutter comes in many, in many forms. And you know, we know now that attention is so much stronger on TV, but why? So what we wanted to consider was, does coverage, coverage as being a proportion of a screen that the ad covers, play a role? Okay, the beautiful thing about this is, bear in mind, I've just talked to you a little bit about how we did the experiment. We did not, change the amount of ads people naturally saw in any platform. Okay, so I can't, I can't look at clutter across platform because that would mean I would have to restrict or add in numbers of ads on a Facebook or YouTube scenario and then that's not natural, right? But what we can look at is how much of the screen an ad covers and does that impact attention. Now let me explain. The other thing we did in the back of this code is apart from ad intercept, um, video downloads, camera activation, this little smart electron app did also um, measure ad pixels on screen. Who knows what viewability is in the, in the online standards? So, so pixels on screen is the amount of the ad that's on screen. So whether it's, that the current standard is 50%. Okay, so we measured pixels on the screen because the technology literally tagged it. We also then looked at time on screen, that's obvious and that's easy, but also screen coverage. So every single time someone loaded the ad, it automatically could take measurement of the app, or sorry, of the device that they were on, regardless of whether it's a small mobile, big mobile, big TV, small TV, other device, instantly. And what that enabled us to do was kind of go, okay, well, knowing that, does coverage matter in terms of the ability to drive attention and subsequent sales? Um, but before I do, I wanted to try to sort of describe or just, you know, the, the actual output of that. Um, and you know what, I don't think that you would be this shocked. This is pretty sort of fairly standard expectation. Screen coverage on TV is about three times that of YouTube and 10 times that of Facebook, okay? Now bear in mind this is all PC and all TV, so original screen, so mobile's next. Um, but that's on average what coverage for 100% pixel ads. Now that's being fair because very few ads reach 100% pixels on the, particularly Facebook. Um, and compared to TV. So TV always gets 100% pixels, 100% coverage, 100% of the time, whereas you can kind of see the differences there. Now, so we were going, well, okay, so if we then cross-relate that to our attention data and our sales data, does it make a difference? Absolutely. Um, and so it kind of comes down to if you can't see the ad, then you can't be paying attention to it and it can't drive a sale. So we found really, really strong relationship between coverage and sale and coverage and attention. And again, you know, I know that Earl was talking about just spurious correlations. This was regressed, but also it was multiple sets of data. So, you know, same pattern, significant sameness. So when you then kind of overlay it back to our active watching numbers, the patterns are quite striking. So more screen coverage, without a doubt, gains more active attention. Clutter on screen increases non-viewing and passive viewing behavior. Again, to me it's not rocket science, but I'm not sure that people really have physically sort of seen that in front of them. 
so with pixels, there's a point at which, say on Facebook or YouTube, it can only get to 100%, right? But because of the amount of coverage, we could see that um, as pixels approach their limit of possibility, coverage becomes more vital. So they limit themselves and could get more attention and could get more sales because if, if they had a full screen, for example, like TV. So put it another way, 100% pixels covering a larger proportion of the screen has a greater impact than 100% pixels covering a smaller proportion of the screen. So pixels matter, but coverage matters perhaps even more. So I think the power of coverage, this is my second big takeout, is grossly underestimated by many marketers. And this goes back to that's what, dry, that's what good media support, um, does and supports brand growth through being seen. Then we kind of wanted to understand, okay, so attention's one thing, clutter, but how can a platform support brand quality and build these memory structures which are important to brand growth and the long-term brand building? So we kind of, again, being tech, we decided to consider absolute brand size. Now, there's been lots of work on brand quality. In fact, Jenny Romaniel from Professor Jenny Romaniel from Aaron Boo Bass has done so much work in this space. She co-authored a chapter in my book on this. Um, so, but what we decided to do was use an annotation tool on the, on the ads that we had. So we basically built this little annotation tool, which in essence kind of tracked. We, we, just, we told it, we, did, we trained it what the brand looks like and we, and we let it run across it. And basically what it could do, we picked three metrics of importance to us and we had a look at brand frequency, so how often the brand appeared within the ad, entry timing, which um, again, Professor Romaniok knows that and has suggested that's really important for early entry and brand prominence, average size of the brand within the ad. And I don't think that's been done very much, and if it has, it'd be largely subjective, poor coders sitting there for six months. So we were able to go, done. So what we then did is we split the higher performing ads with the lower performing ads through the median, and just went, can we see any differences between the two types? And sure enough, higher performing ads showed the brand at twice the size, um, showed the brand almost twice as often, Okay, and 25% more likely to display the brand early. So we kind of say that all brand metrics, all good brand metrics matter, but we could definitely see prominence was a stronger predictor of success within the stats of the higher performing ads. So we say brand prominence matters. And the reality is size is related to coverage anyway. So there's something you can do. If you're creative in the room, you should actually just if you're putting ads in a, in a digital forum, um, upscale the brand prominence, but I think the size of the screen helps too, and we can see that. So one last little thing, how else was brand prominence considered? So some other, um, some other programming nuances, I guess, within particularly the TV forum, and, and each platform has its own programming strengths, um, but we wanted to have a look about at, at sponsorship, really. So, you know, there's a lot of um, in content, in, in programming brand uh, sponsorship. So we, we thought, well, we have the, the, we, we have the test and control groups. Let's try and have a look and separate out whether a typical 30-second ad is actually better or worse than, I probably shouldn't use the word worse, all advertising is good. Um, <laughs> oops, <laughs> um, between a, a programming or non. And the other thing we did do, and I won't, I won't go into too much detail, we also then subcoded it by way of the talent interacting with the brand. So in this case, the MasterChef contestants are actually going into Coles, running around, interacting with the brand versus Gary from MasterChef. <laughs> I had to get his name from Kim the other day. I'm so bad. Um, in the background. He'll probably turn up one day and go, you don't know who I am, do you? Um, and, or just in the background. Uh, the reality is, short segue, is when it's big and they're interacting with the brand, it's stronger than when it's, when it's just in the background. Obviously, because that's a prominence thing. 
But the reality is we found that sponsorship in quality content does have an effect on sales and attention. Um, and, you know, I guess that is, um, like I said, it's a prominence thing and it's um, exciting if you want to get your brand noticed, cut through. Um, so being able to see the brand does matter and coverage facilitates brand prominence. I think that's the third outcome. I was asked the other day whether there was, you know, this is groundbreaking and I think it's just so simple to me. I almost am embarrassed that they say that. But I think it's the, the combination of the fact that it's individual level, single source data combined with technology that minimises all this human bias at scale that makes it unique not so much the findings because to me I expected these findings to hold so when I kind of say being able to see the brand matters isn't really that surprising to me. So last slide, um, I haven't told you everything. So in two weeks I'm presenting at Rethink um, and there's a whole nother section and I tease you slightly where we looked at and went deeper into the viewability, the online viewability research uh, um, standard. So we've already talked about our technology managing to capture pixels, time and coverage. So there are three um, measures of OTS. But what I haven't told you is what we found with pixels and time and what that means for the standard. So I guess for me today, all roads lead back to being seen and coverage is at the core of much of the impact but I want you to come along and have a look at what we've done that extends this work and it's actually quite exciting. So thanks for your time.